at the time when we were in the pandemic, we were all just the same as white men. So have I built something culturally that's really toxic? Um, are we really unwelcoming to women? Are we really unwelcoming to people from different ethnic backgrounds or different sexualities and that kind of stuff? I'm straight, white, male. In terms of challenges I've had in life, I haven't had that many. I've had a few, but there are others in society that have had, had a lot more. You can't go into meetings and have a team with this culture where it's just, just blokes, you know, but it wasn't purposeful. It wasn't done on purpose. Alex, thanks for coming on the show. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks, Chris. Thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. Congratulations as well. I saw um, you won a paid media award last week. Uh, was that for Greenpeace? That's right. So it was Charity Campaign of the Year. I think it's really embarrassing. One of the team here does all the work, delivers all the work, manages the client. And so it's nothing to do with me. But we are now a hashtag award-winning agency. Brilliant. That's great news. Is that the first one then? So that, for that campaign, I think we've won four awards over the last year for it. So it's the first time we've really decided to enter awards and go for it on that scale. And I think it's that perfect mix for us of it's the client profile, the awards, the quality of the work that we've done. And then the fact that it's also purpose driven is really appealing as well. Yeah, yeah. It ticks a lot of boxes, doesn't it? So today's mm. episode is all about building um, a purpose driven business. And you describe your mission as an agency on your website um, as an agency that wants to prove that digital marketing can have a positive impact, not just on client results, but the environment too. So for a bit of context, who are Climbing Trees and has this purpose come from day one or was there like an epiphany moment that changed the direction of the agency? So we are a search marketing agency. We run social ads and we do programmatic. Uh, we've been going about 13 years or so. And I think with regards to purpose, there were a few emergent threads in the earlier phase of the business when I was setting up working from a home office. And so we did things, there was a charitable organisation called Trees for Cities and it had been about 2011, we were planting trees in cities, unsurprisingly. Um, and so we worked with them. We've always picked up charity accounts and actually really given tremendous value to them. So done stuff free of charge. So we've always had that. And I think what happened for us is just three years ago now. So we're recording this. It's the 28th today. So it's the 23rd of March in 2020 that we went into lockdown. Right. Like a lot of agency owners, we were just all getting clients having to cancel, pulling work, unsure what was going to happen. It was like driving off the cliff or something. Mm. And new business was dead. Everyone was on lockdown, working from home. So I didn't actually have a lot of work to do. So my role is leadership, new business. And I'd spoken to a couple of people. I'd spoken, I've got a good friend, Nicola, that runs a PR agency down in Newquay. And I spoke to the guys at Jago as well. And they both advocated for B Corp. We'd done some stuff around planting trees. That was a climate emergency. You saw forest fires in Germany, Australia, California. It was like, it, was, it felt like a really quite sort of powerful moment in sort of world history. Mm. And so all of that sort of combined, where I had some free time. So I went through this thing called the B Impact Assessment, and that allowed that which is you do to become a B Corp. And I think that allowed us to really start going through in quite a meticulous fashion all of the points that you can in the business to really try and do better as a business. Because I think a lot of people can agree that there are a lot of problems in the world, environmentally, socially, we have real challenges to actually address and we can as individuals do what we do at home domestically um, as a business owner, I can do my best in business. And I think business is the opportunity broadly to actually step up and lean into some of these issues and actually do better because from central government, big business, the pace of change is so tediously slow. There's not that much happening. And I think, been a bit of a rebellious stoke. I've always wanted to almost, you know, just carve my own way. So to try and do things in what I say is a better way, I think there is a community of business owners that passionately want to do that. And most business owners, when I speak to people like you or other people in the industry, they want to have impact. They want to make a difference. They want to, you know, harness that purpose. So what is B Corp? Because we're seeing, you know, more and more businesses and agencies getting this certificate. Can you just tell us what it is and why it's so important and what the process is to, to get uh, to become a B Corp corporation. For sure. 
So I think, so accreditations are a bit like awards. And so there are awards that have real value, like being a Google Premier Partner or being like the, the best of those in terms of the award winning category that they have. You can get other um, certifications where you can send 500 quid away and get a trophy through the post. Um, and so with regards to the ESG certifications, Gavin at Kyan always says there's about 400 you can go through. Some very simple, where you don't have to change a lot. And B Corp is a really thorough process that goes through a whole load of different areas in the business, workers, customers, governance, society, and the environment. And so you go through these sections and you look at how you impact on them and you go through all of the sort of questions that you can have. And then at the end of it, you're assigned a score. And so the average for a UK business is 51. To become a B Corp, you need to be 80 and the maximum is 200. And so there are various points given. If you're um, a female led business, you'll get more points than a male led business because what they're trying to do is to bring equality to the workplace um, and out in society. And so I think B Corp is the gold standard. It was not hard work to go through. It was a lot of work, but it wasn't, it wasn't nothing. It's like we were agency owners running really complex campaigns on Google, Facebook, whatever. We can do all that kind of stuff and do it with a degree of eloquence and uh, commitment. With regards to all this stuff, it's not hard work. It's just a lot of work to actually get through. So we changed so much in the business as a result of it. Yeah, because it's not a marketing gimmick, is it? This, this is, you know, you've got to be really serious if, if you want this and, and you've got to have firm beliefs, really. And it's not just environmental either, is it? Because I think some of the perception is it's a lot about how sustainable you are or, or you know, um, are you carbon net zero, for example? But actually, like you say, it's diversity and things like that are all included in this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's easy, if you want to do greenwashing and get a logo to bang on your website and email footers to show your green credentials, there's easier ways to do it. And so typically the kind of organisations that do go through it have to meet that exacting sort of criteria. With regards to what it looks at, for me as a white man, right, I'm real comfortable talking about sustainability in the environment. That's a very safe place. When it comes to matters of diversity, right, I'm straight, white, male. In terms of challenges I've had in life, I haven't had that many. I've had a few, but there are others in society that have had, had a lot more. And so, for example, we had to look at the business in terms of the, uh, the makeup of the, the, the team. At the time when we were in the pandemic, we were all just a team of white men. And so I went through this period of introspection where I was thinking, am I just a misogynist, woman-hating person? Have I built something culturally that's really toxic? Are we really unwelcoming to women? Are we really unwelcoming to people from different ethnic backgrounds or different sexualities and that kind of stuff? And so I don't think I am, but I went through and I questioned that. And we're doing some work now in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion, making sure that for the leadership team here, we strip out and are aware of all those sort of unconscious biases that you can have. So we set in place some diversity targets and we're a you know, relatively small business up in North Essex. Essex is a very white county. Um, and so the, the pool of talent within a geographic area of um, the, the office is quite like, it's a very white background. Mm. But I think we, we could have just said, and left it at that, but what we wanted to do was change ourselves. So we want to be in line with the national average from a gender, ethnicity, and sexuality perspective. So that our team that are supporting our clients is representative of the world our clients operate in. So we set those targets in place three years ago, and we're now, we've got, um, I think 33% women, 66% men. We have different ethnic backgrounds. We have different sexualities. We have different neurodiversities. We've got someone with um, ADHD. We've got someone with um, autism um, that actually work and support our, our clients. And these are, I think what it does as a team, those differences, we're able to uh, respond to client briefs in a way where those differences almost allow us to interrogate things and they almost bind us together. So it's not just a laddish perspective on what's going on we can start thinking in the more um, eloquent and delightful way about the solutions we're offering our clients and those differences almost bind us together as a team it's really weird how it works but we're a much mm. much better business now than we're going into the whole thing and without b corp i was just focused on 
keeping the lights on, making payroll. And, you know, it's been quite a profound difference. In terms of the team, right, sorry to go on about it, um, we have given our team a cost of living pay rise last year. 100% of our team have received training. We've had team members receive coaching, mentoring. Um, and so we really sort of have doubled down. We've got private health insurance. In terms of our retention as a result of all those initiatives, and they're not that expensive as a business, we hold on to our team. You know, we are we retain our team, and I think it's easier to do that at the size we are, which is 15 people. When you're getting up to 30, 40, 50s, I think there are other challenges that you'll face. Um, but for the moment, I think that has really sort of bound us together. So going back to that diversity, I mean, obviously, like you say, you're a team of, of white, straight blokes, effectively. And, you know, how do you then go through that recruitment process? Because you can't put a job ad out saying, you know, apply for this position but you know we're not going to give a job to to white white men you know it, it's how how do you tackle that because it's a really like a tough challenge surely to to exclude Absolutely. based on that because it kind of it's the reverse of what you're trying to achieve and you know I've I've been there myself when we we were um you know we had too many guys and it was just like you know it's you can't go into meetings and have a team with this culture where it's just just blokes you know but it wasn't purposeful it wasn't done on purpose it was just those people that were coming through and applying for the position and you're, you're rewarding it on merit right so how did you Absolutely. approach that and I, and I think it's um i think there was a period of introspection that i took so as the leader i had to do better on that I could say, oh, I'm too busy, or this oh, is just how things are, Essex is white, or my men just want to work in digital. So I could come up with all that offhand dismissiveness, which is rubbish, right? Um, or, so what we chose to do is change a whole load of stuff. So I did a lot of reading, I did a lot of listening, I asked for feedback on LinkedIn, and so I just got a whole wealth of feedback about things we could do better. So we started putting all of our job descriptions through a program called Textio where we could strip out male language. So right. men will respond to um, specific things like targets and that kind of thing. And there's a different language that you can use that's maybe a little bit in your neutral that, so that women feel comfortable like responding. We have an interview panel now. So I think before I got CVs in and if I got a CV from someone called John Smith, being an Englishman, John Smith's gonna be very comfortable with me. If I got a, a CV from someone that signified an eth another um, ethnicity, so for example, I used to work with a guy in about 2000 called, he was from Zimbabwe, he was the most fantastic man I ever met, he's called uh, Gary Kai Mushambadope. But, but Gary Kai Mushambadope is a very different background to me. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, so yeah. I think at an unconscious level, that could bias me. So what we, done, we do now is CVs through the website, we ask for no name, no identifying features, so we get blind CVs in. So we're looking at this CV, almost stripping that stuff out and thinking, technically, can we put them forward for interview? We now have an interview panel made up of one man, one woman. They both have equal say in the final decision. And so I think in the past, I might have been scrambling around for recruitment, had a chat with someone, and in the early days of the business, it would have come down to, could I tolerate sitting opposite this person for eight hours and could they tolerate me, right? And then, um, you know, will they be able to get on and do a good job? So it was quite a crude sort of recruitment process. And so I, th and I think the other thing we do is we talk about this. So we talk about this as a, as a leadership team and we talk about this as a business because we want to carry on doing better. And so I don't think it's all sort of done. And so that's part of the reason why We've got this diversity, equity and inclusion um, training, which goes into really complex stuff, which I've got no um, real experience of. So it goes into, you've got racism and you've got not racist, but not racist is almost racist. And so you need to be anti-racist. So you actually come, need to come out and say, we will not tolerate behaviour that is um, anything other than exceptional to treating people from different backgrounds. I'm reading stuff at the moment about um people from different um that have different sexualities and that kind of thing i can't even pronounce it i feel so worried about talking about it um but i think it's um it's just eye-opening and thinking about what it's like for individuals in those communities to face some of the challenges they have 
is there stuff that we can do as leaders to actually make that path better, then why wouldn't we? Okay, so, so yeah, like you say, a lot of it is un- unconscious bias then, if you like, in things that you don't even think about, but also, like you say, it's looking at it from perhaps their perspective in terms of encouraging more applicants from different cultures, diversities and, and backgrounds, basically, in the language that you're using perhaps in those job ads. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely, and showing that you're welcoming to those sort of people. Yeah. To it. And I think we've changed our branding. That's a little bit softer, a little bit less geeky. So, yeah, I think it all just, it's like another drop in the bucket. It's the incremental gains to improve, I think. Mm. So, I mean, can we go back a bit? I mean, how did you get into agency world? How did, how did uh, Climbing Trees come about? So, I sort of fell into working in the ad industry. Um, I, had, I remember I was about um, 18 or so. I had three job interviews. And I was a bit, I don't know, I wasn't that focused or driven when I was young. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I still don't. Um, but I think it's... Uh, <laughs> like in- it's not an agency <laughs> owner, I know that much, Alex. I had, um, I had three interviews, and um, one was at Billingsgate Meat Market, one was at an insurance company, and one was at uh, Zenith Media. And I didn't know anything about these businesses. I had no real sort of... I thought I, I, thought I knew it all, but I actually knew nothing looking back. I didn't get the job at the meat market or the insurance company. Um, and I remember I had a, there was a guy, finance director at Zenith Media, Colin McCreevy, interviewed me. And he said, well, why do you want to work with us? And I, th- I think I was honest, right? And I think I said something along the lines of, well, to be honest, I don't want to work at a big company. I have to come in and sing the company song. I'd, you know, I just want to you know, get, you know, get a job and sort of crack on a little bit. And I think he'd probably seen the procession of people that were coming in to say, I'm really enthusiastic about working um, in this really junior role that's quite terrible. Um, And I think I probably, that sort of little bit of personality that I had um, allowed me to get the job. So by the time I got home, I got the job offer, started the next week and I was working at what at the time was the largest media agency in the UK, um, in the most junior role in the building and um, worked for really good people and I was a bit of a hell raiser and um, I sort of cracked on. I realised at that point, I can't just idle my time away. I need to really step up and work hard. And so that's what that really strong work ethic came out in me then. Went through three of the top five media agencies in the UK, moved on to planning and buying press, radio and TV campaigns in the 90s. This was Some of this was before the internet was around. Uh, mm. That's how old I am. And so um, I then came out of London to work for a startup in 2001. And that grew to a 25 million turnover business. And so about 20 years ago, I started learning about web application development, learning about coding. And then I set up an offering internally in this traditional media agency, doing SEO, PPC, affiliate marketing. Um, We did some Facebook ads when Facebook came around in 2004. And um, I think, you know, I learned a lot, worked alongside the owner. He was a tremendous entrepreneur, had no equity in it. And so in 2010, I thought, I'm going to just set up on my own. I'm going to pick and choose the clients I work with and I want five days work a week. That was the big dream. So it was the freelance journey, really. It was just do your own thing. Absolutely. And so I picked and chose the gigs I worked on. I worked for a fantastic startup called Amara, who at the time were half a million. They grew to 27 million turnover. And um, I did. I helped them build an in-house team. And so I coached and mentored this young team and did that for a couple of years. And then I sort of worked with other freelancers, but didn't ever really want an office staff and overheads. Probably lack of confidence or something. And how did you fall into that then? How did it become an agency? Um, I think there's, going around the block, there's confidence that you get, isn't there? So in the yeah. agency world, you've got how do you find clients, how do you retain clients, how do you deliver services, how do you deliver on the promises you make? And it's the same almost with staff, isn't it? And so I learned some of that stuff. Um, but I think there was an overwhelming frustration in terms of building that shared vision in terms of this is what we're doing. When you're working with other freelancers, everyone's captain of their own ship, aren't they? Mm. And so you're not always going in the same direction. And so recruiting staff was born out of wanting a team all on the bus, facing the right direction, going in the same way. And then in terms of like those clients that you work with now versus then, are they very different? So were you always sort of working with charities and sort of ethical brands? I mean, do you, when you chose the route to go down the B Corp, for example, and, and start looking more at, 
your own sustainability, etc. Did you have to look at the clients you work with then? Did you change who, who you work with? Yes, absolutely. So there's been a process and an evolution to that. And so my background is working for like Lloyd's, who are a £70 million account in, I don't know, 97 or whatever it is. And then when I set up, I was working for smaller independent businesses turning over £5 million. Our client profile is sort of dialing up. So we're dealing with global brands like Olympus Cameras, Volvo uh, Construction and Greenpeace. So really famous brands. And then behind mm. that, we've got this subset of really strong businesses, but not that prestigious, not that famous, but a really good trading businesses turning over between about five and 30 million. In that first phase of the business, if you'd have turned up to the office with a crisp five pound note and said, I want to do some digital marketing, I'd have found you a seat and we'd have done something. I wouldn't have really thought about what you were doing as a business or anything like that. And so we're obviously qualifying and doing much, much better with that now. And I think there has been a process whereby um, we've had some clients that are operating in sectors that when we think about it, we don't really want to. And so we had one of them, a good friend of mine, got a job at a Swedish startup. There's now a thousand people turning over just shy of a billion pound a year. And so they do sports betting software, right? Right. And so I was like, he said, well, oh, can you work with us? I was like, yeah, of course we can. So we're running like ad campaigns on a global basis for that. And then we go through the B Corp process and we start thinking about our impact and the impact that we have, the largest impact that we have. We've got the team, we've got society, but the clients are a massive impact. So the impact our clients have, and we start thinking about that, and we start thinking, well, gambling industry, when you think about it, it's like, you know there's going to be some poor souls that will destroy their lives based on that. 99% of the people will be fine, but there'll be some people that won't. And so we're just sort of shifting uncomfortable. I'm like, my mate's the marketing director over there, right? And so mm. I, um, I fudged it for a while. I avoided it, hoped it would go away, didn't. Uh, carried on working with us. And then um, I made the decision. We did a survey with our team. So we said to the team, how do you feel working about the, in these sectors? So it could be adult industry, adult services. It could be... Um, selling sugary sweets to children it could be gambling carbon intensive industries uh prob confusing i had one th uh, with, uh, one section was companies that had problems with child labor so for example nike had problems in vietnam with that i think at one point and um one of my team clicked yes they'd be happy to do that so i think it was a data entry error. i don't think they were hoping for that and so we built out this consensus from the team in terms of this is the, the pulse of what the business thinks they would work on I've got vegans in the business. They wouldn't want to work on meat accounts. Mm. If I had a team member that was from um, a Muslim background, for example, I wouldn't expect them to work on alcohol brands. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah, we yeah. Built up, so we built up this policy, which is um, a client screening thing. And so we say no to a lot of stuff. We've turned away six figure projects from people that are in the carbon industry, uh, shipping industry. And that was a really awkward one because that was my friend. He's managing director of mm -hmm. business. We had to say no. And so we, we, we verify now much better in terms of client screening for new clients. We've turned the wheel with our existing clients and this gambling client, that's, we're wrapping up that project on the 31st of March. I took my friend out for lunch, shifting uncomfortably, expecting him to feel really rejected and angry. And I said, a bit nice it is. I said, right, we're gonna have to stop working with you. And he was like, I've been expecting this. Why didn't you say so earlier? And he just made the whole thing as easy as possible. And so we've handled, we've given them, gave them three months notice, they're able to find another agency, they're gonna have business continuity. Uh, so we wouldn't do anything reckless. And then we just have to replace those billings. That's, that's so a really if, brave step. Yeah, I mean, it's hats off to you. That's really sticking to your guns, isn't it? And I think you have to, and I think, because the team will be looking at me. And it's, the interesting thing is I've, we've got a lead through for a shop selling vapes. So you think, well, actually, so we wouldn't work with the tobacco industry. So vaping, it's like, well, it's not that bad. It's not killing you. You've not got, like, probably not got cancer. But what you know, and one of my team came to me and said, I've got real concerns about this. And it's not, it wasn't in our policy. Um, marketed towards children. You get all the bubble gum flavors, bright yeah. colors in supermarkets, right next to the sweets by the checkout. It's just encouraging a young, young population into smoking. Um, 
And so a team member came to me and said, we shouldn't be doing this. And I was, at the time, I wasn't on the same page as them. I was just looking at budgets they've got, size of the opportunity, thinking, excellent, we acquired this quiet, we, move, we can move forward, we can build out the team. And so I had to go away, a bit of reflection, think about it. And then we, we didn't work with that client. And, that's, and, and so there are commercial imperatives to everything that we do. And so whilst we're growing and doing well, it's easy to say no to stuff because we can qualify that stuff out because our pipeline is mm. strong in other sectors. It'd be interesting to see what I do if we're on a bad run, we're losing clients, we're in a recession. The VP pipeline. knock on your door. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's, yeah, again, like you say, it's really sort of, Rest not restricting, but as a business owner, you're looking at, yeah, where are the opportunities and everything else? And I suppose if you get a really massive opportunity through and, and it doesn't align with your beliefs, then, then you're turning that down. But that's, that, yeah, credit to you and, and your agency and for, for having that. And I think as part of the B Corp process, we, ha we have to produce an impact report. And so I'm doing our first one for last year. And so we will have to be transparent about these are the sectors we worked in. Mm. And so... We will uncover all of this stuff, and it's that to have that transparency and authenticity, um, because you know ultimately what we want to try and do is where we really leverage with clients is like Greenpeace. We've got a team member who absolutely loves them, we've got a client we absolutely love, we've got the skills that we can do. We know we've got first rate in terms of the campaigns we can build. There's almost like this synergy and the power that 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 drives in terms of our ex execution. Um, there's a lot more sort of you know people give a damn about that kind of thing. I think. Yeah, yeah. So besides from the obvious, like you say, if it's um, a, you know a company that outwardly doesn't align with your, you know, your your agency's um, ethical standpoint, etc. What, what are there any questions that you ask them to sort of you know get under the hood a bit and, and dig a bit further? Because outwardly they might not be doing things that, that are necessarily wrong, but inside or behind the scenes. Like you say, like with Nike, with child labour, they're not going to broadcast that on their website, are they? It's only if you dig a bit further. No, and, so, and, and there's a grey area. So if we just work with charities, you can typically argue they're pretty much going to be a net positive for society. Yeah. Um, we've got clients that sell stuff, Olympus cameras, right? Or uh, we've got outdoor furniture companies or fragrance companies. We haven't gone right into their supply chain, making sure that they're doing everything exceptionally. So we don't interrogate them at a forensic level but what we will do as part of the qualification process we have the external process we go through with the client and then the internal week process we go through where we actually sort of scratch a little bit beneath the surface and think is this organization one that we want to work with and we're not just working with purpose-driven brands um, but you want to make sure that the brands you are working with and the companies you are working with are conducting themselves in a really sort of fair and equitable way and I think because there's so much opportunity for improvement in the world, right? There's issues all over the place, left, right and centre, societally and environmentally. We could just operate at this tier where everyone's ethically perfect, like pure and fantastic and like levitating above us all with their like perfectness. Um, I think that messy bit in the middle and then operating in there and then talking about this kind of stuff, what I hope is, and being, I think trying to be quite authentic and uncover your shortcomings and where you need to do better and being quite humble about it, I think that is hopefully more attractive to people where people actually think, I might have a go at that. I could have, you know, I think I could do that. Or do you know what I mean? Mm. What about the, the team as well then? So, you know, are there any questions in, in the recruitment process around the, you know, the, the brands and, and that? that purpose that you've got do you look for any qualities in them so i think our onboarding process is i think we've got the technical stuff we've got do we think we can get on with them we've got the attitudinal stuff in terms of how they conduct themselves and you know, the sort of feeling you get for them i think we're not just building a team of people that have this in their lifeblood right so if people want to come here, we have some fantastic technical operators that join us and they're like pleased that we're doing all this stuff, but it's, doesn't, it's not their passion, it's not their, their sort of life force. There's other people who are speaking to someone about a role we've got and the fact that we are a B Corp, she said, I've always wanted to work for a B Corp. And so out there in the world, there's a generation of workers coming into like the workforce that don't want to work for the man, they don't want to work for 
companies that are causing problems in society. They want to work and have careers at organisations that are actually trying to do something positive in the world. And so mm. in terms of recruitment and attraction, but we've never had it so good. And I'm just going to touch some wood because I appreciate that's quite a cocky thing to say. But we're able to attract staff because of that proposition. So, And I think what will happen through time is because of that foundational element to us, we'll attract staff and clients that actually care about this. So they have a shared worldview and belief. Yeah, and I think we see this. Obviously, you've just done that, that green fashion report, haven't you? I was looking through that. And obviously, you know, even consumers, when they're looking at buying clothes and things like that, they're looking at sustainability now as a consideration, aren't they, from which brands they actually buy from. So I guess looking at the companies they work for in terms of their job is, is the same thing, right? Absolutely. And I think there is, um, I think there'll be two sides. I think everything in society seems to be quite polem polemic in terms of there's no like, mid ground, there's no sort of meeting in the middle. And I think with regard, there'll be people that deny climate change and the environment that we need to care about the planet and look after things and be environmentally friendly. And there'll be those that do. Um, and I think out of those that do, there is a growing consensus about um, the impact that your purchasing and your money has. So the brands you buy, where you spend stuff. Um, so it's like your pension. If you change your pension to an ESG fund versus something else, you'll have 41 times more impact than you would do changing your electric supply or something like that. So where we spend money is increasingly important. And so with regards to fashion, and I think it's that uh, the consumerism in society, if you're a business... If you can make a T-shirt that someone uses for three months and then come back and buy another T-shirt, that's a great model, right? Repeat, re re repeat revenue. The, the legacy of that in terms of the staff you've got making those T-shirts, the impact on the environment is really quite profound and negative. And so you have companies in the marketplace that are doing, trying to move towards the circular economy whereby you've got a pair of jeans, you've got a little hole in them. 15, 20 years ago, I'd just send them to landfill, wouldn't thought twice about it. Now these companies are actually saying, send them back to us, we'll repair them. I've got a pair of shoes on uh, Vivo Barefoot, they're called, and the soles are just about to wear through. I'll send them back to the manufacturer, they'll resell them and send them back. So they're not going to waste. And so I think that circularity, you see it in companies like, um, f uh, in countries like France, sorry, where they have the repairability index. So if you're buying a washing machine, they'll say this washing machine is more repairable than this washing machine. So as a consumer, you know that if you buy a washing machine and it goes wrong, usually people just say, I'll just throw it out and get a new one. Because it, but at the moment, it's that, that repairability and responsibility as a business to actually own the full life cycle of the product from when people buy it through to when it's disposed of. That bit, I think, really needs to be added on in the world. And so that sustainability report speaks to that because there is an upswing in sort of commercial appetite from people to have products that actually meet the needs of those searches as a business yourself you you do things like you buy second-hand computers and things like that what what are the things that agencies or businesses can do to be sort of more sustainable and um ethically responsible so i think so with sustainability right three years ago i was blind to all this stuff mm. uh b impact assessment on their environment what energy uh, are you using so we moved offices about five years ago and i just said to someone Go and sort out the electric, and they did. But it wasn't on renewable, and so we'd operated the business, so we were using like probably coal power or something like that. And so we then changed the electric supplier, so it's all renewable energy, really simple. Um, and that reduced our um, carbon footprint uh, quite significantly. With regards to stuff like if we buy brand new laptops, you have a carbon footprint of that machine. If you buy second hand, the carbon footprint is diminished because you're putting money into the second market um, rather than just buying like virgin, like brand new products and that kind of thing. The whole pandemic helped massively, which is a really um, peculiar statement in terms of the switch from, I was always traditional. I wanted everyone in the office five days a week. If anyone wanted to work from home, I was just like, what, you want to sit around in a onesie watching Jeremy Carr whilst I pay you and you're not really working? I just didn't believe it would work. And I was wrong. The pandemic proved that to me. And so people not driving into the office and then driving back, that reduces the footprint. A lot of our clients are now very, very comfortable with meeting online and virtual meetings rather than driving to the office, doing a meeting, then driving back. Um, although I still think 
there is a place for that face-to-face -face in terms of for the team and for clients as well. You cannot build chemistry, trust and rapport as well online as you can in person. I think that in-person nature to everything is um, a really sort of special thing. So we know there's a imp negative impact to doing it, but I think we need to do it to operate as a business. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and in terms of like, you know, is that all your products? Is it just computers? So like stationary, things like that? Is it, where, what sort of checklist have you got, if you like, that really sort of evaluates all this and how like, your goal is to be carbon net zero? Is that right? Yes. And that's going to be tricky. And I'll, I'll mm. come, so I'll come on to some of the stuff we're doing on that. So in terms of stationary, we've got a B Corp supplier. We try and buy recycled products wherever possible. Um, we try to reuse as much as possible. Um, with, and with regards to net zero, so net zero is carbon footprint, reduce it by 90% and offset the rest. And so without wanting to get into too much detail, there are different scopes of carbon emissions. Scope one, two and three. So one is if we had a gas boiler here, we'd be emitting carbon on site. We don't, so we have no scope one emissions. Scope two is the stuff we buy. So that's like um, electric and that kind of stuff where there are emissions from what we're buying offsite. And we've reduced that down to a point where it's negligible. Um, so scope three is then the services we buy, whether we go on flights, whether we go on the train, whether we uh, work with a, um, so for instance, we're changing our insurance company at the moment to work with one that is a B Corp. So the money that we spend as an organization is being spent uh, with an organization that is um, has the same world view as us, but would actually have the same care and attention to the environment and that kind of thing. So we're deploying that money we're spending um, in a way that is um, as considered as possible. And there's a process to that. So we haven't just gone, ditched all these long established relationships um, with you know, suppliers like accountants and that kind of stuff, and just got, gone about face. I'm trying to advocate for change. I'm, you know, I've taken my accountant out for lunch a couple of times um, and I'm continually talking about this because I think there's an opportunity for us all to do better. Um, and if people aren't prepared to do that after a time, we might have to change things. So it's not just about, you know, just, just choosing uh, someone straight away. It's, is it changing their mindset? You know, is there work to be done there? Is there more reward in that? Like you say, your accountants, well, that, for example. Absolutely, that messy bit in the middle and the advocacy pace, I think sometimes in conversation you can tell whether someone's open-minded or not. And if they are, that advocacy pace can get somewhere. There are other times where it's just like, door shut in your face, not interested, not, not on my radar right now. And so then I'm faced with a decision as a business owner as to what I do with that. Mm. And is there someone in your business, like how do, how do you practically implement this? Have you got someone in your business that looks at energy suppliers, et cetera? Is that, is that you or is that someone else? So that's me and we have a leadership team here. Um, we've worked with an external company, a fantastic chap called Eddie at C3. And we do a forensic analysis of everything we spend in the year. And then he has um, a system whereby we'll get a report to actually give us clarity on this is your carbon impact across the business, across scope one, two, and three. We've got a benchmark for 2019 pre-pandemic. We've got a benchmark for 2020 in the pandemic and changing electric supply. So we know that went down 55% our carbon footprint. But then we came out of the pandemic, it's gone back up again, and we've changed our reporting system to move to a more forensic analysis. And so we're just about to get 2022's data so we're going to compare 21, 22, and I imagine our carbon footprint has gone up because we've got out into the world a bit more, we're billing more, our clients are passing their media spend through the business. And so I think our carbon footprint would have gone away from us. And it's just to be transparent about that. But what we can then do is lean into, well, why has it gone up? And then what can we do about actually reducing it and be forensic on a line by line item? And we'll do that as a senior management team. Um, and then people will be assigned you know, things to take care of and then we'll put back on it and try and do better. That's brilliant. And then moving forward then, what's, what's, what's the future look like for climbing trees? How, how else are you looking to, to change the world, if you like? Um, well, and I think as being, being a B Corp, right, in the UK, we've got more B Corps than any other country. 
So there's 1,200 in London, there's more than anyone else. And that's why there's this upswing in sort of interest. And I mm. hope that just continues. So we're a small part of a wider movement. And ultimately, the belief is it's about business as a force for good. And I think business can be. You think about the impact your business has on your staff, on your clients, on your family, on those in society. You probably do a lot of charitable stuff and things where you look after people less fortunate than yourselves that you, don't, you never talk about, and you, but you just do it. And so a lot of business owners I speak to are like that. They're really influential people that give a damn. And so to be able to then harness that business as a force for good in their business, there's an impact. So for us, it's an impact on our staff. Our staff, we've tried to really double down on looking after them, and we want to continue to do that and then grow as a team. Our clients, we're only successful if they are. Society, um, our impact on society is probably limited, to be honest. We do stuff with regards to the charities we work with, and we offer proper sort of discounted rates for them. As a team, we're trying to do more. So there's a beach cleanup we're getting involved with. There's local charities we're trying to get involved with where we've gone out planting trees. We're trying to advocate for the digital industry in schools. And there was a thing we did where, as part of BEMA, 18% of girls thought the digital industry was one they could join. As a result of the digital day that BEMA do, it's the thing you can do, go into schools, advocate for the digital industry for a day, and you get these bright young minds set a problem. I think last year it was, there's one from Primark and one from Royal Mail, and they then pitch ideas back. And some of them are just out there, like underground delivery tunnels for postage for Royal Mail and all this kind of stuff. But it's like bright young minds. After mm. that, 42% of girls thought the digital industry could be one from them. So it moved from 18% to 42%. Wow. And so... We have this equality problem in the industry, so to be doing grassroots stuff out there in society like that is um, quite valuable, and that's a er massive area of opportunity where we can do better. Environment, I think we're doing our best. Um, we're on top of that. Um, and so then it's the governance piece. And so for the governance piece, we've got two things that we're doing. In everyone's job roles, we are empowering people to have personal responsibility for their impact on the environment. And that's going to be part of what they're measured against. So assigning it to the individual because we're working from home more. And so we'll have conversations about home electric supply, cars people are driving. We have a, um, an embryonic scheme we've set up with Octopus about um, you can do salary sacrifice for electric vehicles. And so we start thinking about all this kind of thing. Um, and then at our management team meeting, for every decision we make, we are thinking about the environmental and societal impact of that decision. And that's across operations, HR, finance, everything. So that we consider those things at that stage rather than what I've had to do three years ago is just sort of scrabble around and think, oh no, I've made a real, real mess of this. I should have been doing much better all along, but I've got to retrofit all this stuff into the business. Mm. That's really, really inspiring. So where can someone um, get in touch with you, Alex? Because I'm sure that other agency owners are looking to do more things like this and, and you know, the experience you've got. Would you be happy to share, share that if people get in touch? Or? Absolutely. As you can tell, I always go on about or enjoy talking about this kind of stuff. That's probably a nice way of putting it. So I'm Alex Hollyman on LinkedIn, or you can contact me through the website, uh, climbingtrees.com. Brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on today, Alex. It's been really useful. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, mate. You've been listening to Confessions of an Agency Owner with me, Chris Ailey. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, subscribe to my newsletter, and find out more about my agency at honchosearch.com. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Until next time.